Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the second session in the series of talks organized by Ornithology.in. For those of who you are not familiar, um, Ornithology.in is a platform that hosts a variety of um, resources and information for students that are interested in uh, bird research in India. Uh, please do check out the website ornithology.in if you have not already done so. Um, today is our second session and our speaker for today is Dr. Monica Koshik. Um, Dr. Monica is a bird researcher from Delhi and she did her bachelor's degree in uh, botany and her post-graduation in environmental biology from Delhi. And for her PhD, she was at the Wildlife Institute of India and her PhD and post-PhD research focused on birds um, in Uttarakhand um, state mostly. Following which she received the Fulbright, Fulbright uh, Nehru Fellowship to study the role of non-native um, avian frugivores or native seed dispersal in uh, the Hawaii Islands. Uh, her research interests include biological invasion, bird habitat associations, urban ecology, monitoring through citizen science programs, and uh, much more that we'll hear about today. She started her research journey uh, studying forest bird species, largely passerine birds, uh, but later also went on to work on um, raptors, frugivores, more recently on urban birds as well. Monica is also a reviewer with eBird India, and um, from her extensive experience working on birds in Uttarakhand state, she also helps um, assure data quality for eBird. She's involved in training uh, different stakeholders involved in bird monitoring prog programs and popular popularizing bird research. And currently, Monica is an assistant professor at the School of Arts and Sciences at the Azim Premji University in Bangalore. Um, prior to this, she was with Ambedkar University uh, for three years, uh, teaching at the MA um, in Environment and Development at the School of Human Ecology at M Ambedkar University. Uh, welcome, Monica. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, over to you, but uh, just two announcements before we get started. Uh, one to all participants that please type in your questions to our speaker today in the chat box. We'll take them all towards the end of the talk. And second, um, please keep your microphones and videos off during the talk, um, just um, so that, that it's, it's uninterrupted. And at the end of the talk, if someone wishes to unmute and speak, um, we will uh, let you do so. Um, so over to you, Monica. Thank you, Preeti. <laughs> um, Thank you everyone for coming here today and um, getting involved in this discussion uh, around um, bird research uh, that I've been doing. I'm really uh, happy um, and at the same time anxious <laughs> what my messages are going to be for you. Um, yeah, so as uh, Preeti uh, this, uh, shared that I have been working on birds uh, and I, I would say that uh, my um, journey or my encounter with bird have been actually uh, accidental and not intentional. I was uh, primarily uh, interested in, um, in plants and studying trees which are stationary and don't move at all. <laughs> but I happened uh, to study uh, bird. So I think bird chose me and it's not the other way around. Uh, today what I'll do, I'll share um, the, the key points of the research that I have done over the years, and I'll try to keep the jargon to the minimum. Um, also, uh, I think one thing that I wanted to start uh, this talk with is this question that uh, what comes into your mind, although the people who are here are more interested in bird, but when you think about it, when you hear this word research or researcher, what is that image that comes into your mind is my question to you. So just think about that, especially for a student who uh, graduated uh, from Delhi and seeing only labs, 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 at least the image that I had in my mind was um, fancy labs, lab codes, and serious looking uh, researcher. And I really did not want to be one of those. Um, but thankfully, there were at least this particular course of community ecology, which exposed me to this very interesting world of not only uh, trees and bird, but also macroinvertebrate, microinvertebrate. And I really wanted to club something 
uh, I wanted to do something that gives me the opportunity to do uh, club field and lab based research. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I think most of you who, who are here today um, must, must have got inspired to do research or are interested in studying uh, natural world because somewhere you are concerned about what is happening on Earth or how the humans are affecting uh, the natural ecosystems of Earth. And that was exactly the concern that I had when I was doing my master, uh, reading in depth about the, uh, the human footprint on multiple ecosystem. And at that time, I was um, interested in doing research, um, but I was looking for that particular, uh, I think, aha moment or aha question. And I happened to uh, listen to this particular scientist, Dr. Ian T. Baldwin, who was working on invasive species. And I got really inspired by his talk and I wanted to study invasive species. Uh, so what are invasive species? I'll just, I hope <laughs> my presentation work. Okay, so uh, the other aim of this presentation is also that uh, I'm one of the um, field researcher and I uh, have been using birds, but a very, I mean, a minimum field um, equipment is what I have uh, at my expense. And that, that is exactly what I'll be sharing that how only uh, observing bird, counting bird in different habitat. Uh, in a very well-designed study could actually help you answer some of the uh, questions that uh, as humans, uh, humanity, we are experiencing. So one first question that I uh, happen to uh, address using bird as a model text, uh, or I would say the plant bird interaction was of the biological invasion. So um, I, I assume that ma majority of you who are here today are aware of what invasive species or biological invasion are, but to uh, some of you who may not have heard of this term is invasive. Uh, I'll just briefly discuss what invasive species are. Invasive species are those species which are usually uh, do not belong to a particular region and have been bought by uh, because of human activities intentionally or unintentionally. So they cross this geographic barrier that they otherwise couldn't and they reach to these new location and establish there. Once they establish there, they are actually free from their predator in their uh, native distribution ranges and competitors uh, that they have been evolving within their native ranges. Um, sometime a uh, very small proportion of these non-native exotic species establishes their territory very well in their non-native regions and uh, in a course of time they actually start utilizing the resources in a better way um, um, than the native or the resident species. So I was really intrigued and amazed by this particular species and I was like, how come, um, um, I mean, this particular species, which is actually out of this place, have this advantage or competitive advantage over the native species? Um, what are the reasons people are getting these species into these new region? Um, and what are the ways in which they are actually affecting the native ecosystem? So these were the questions that were actually puzzling me. Thankfully, I uh, happened to also, um, I think through fate, I encountered Dr. Ankila Hiremat of uh, Atri, and she was um, also a visiting faculty at my department uh, during that time. She was doing some amazing, she's still doing some amazing work on uh, biological, and especially Lantana Kamara. Um, this is another invasive species on Guam Island has resulted in extinction of uh, species. So yeah, I mean, continue my story. So Dr. Ankila Hiremat uh, was doing this amazing research in Western Ghats, uh, studying Lantana Kamara. I am pretty sure you must have also seen this particular species. Um, uh, so I approached her. I wanted to gain research experience uh, with her. Uh, she suggested me to study um, the effect of this particular invasive species on the seed dispersal uh, mutualism. So to again remind myself to cut the jargon, seed dispersal mutualism is a sort of a friendship between the fruiting plant species and the birds uh, that feed on those fruit. So what is happening here, the, the fruiting trees are providing the food to the bird and the uh, frugivorous birds are actually helping 
the seeds to move away from the parent plant. Um, but what happens when a species such as Lantana, which has these enormous uh, number of fruit and that are all, almost available throughout the year, how does that influence um, the seed dispersal of the native uh, species? And that is exactly what I wanted to study. So there are three ways I thought um, invasive species, this invasive species Lantana camara can influence the seed dispersal of the native uh, species first, if it is actually attracting uh, the frugivorous bird to these patches, which are otherwise not really visited by the uh, fruit eating bird, then it is actually helping uh, the native plant species. On the other hand, if let's say the, the birds are busy eating only the lantana fruit, then it's in a way stealing the dispersers away from the native plant. There is also this third scenario where we thought that maybe the fruit, uh, the, the birds that are feeding on lantana are actually different from the one that feed on the native fruiting plant. So there were these three hypotheses that I um, wanted to test in field. So what I did, I actually selected uh, native fruiting tree. I'm again, I, I'll try to keep the jargon to the minimum. You can ask me question later on regarding my study design, etc. So broadly what I did, I selected the native fruiting trees of similar uh, in size to the, uh, to the Lantana Camara, similar in color so that uh, there is this image of fruit in birds mind that they are looking for, which is similar to lantana. So we wanted to study how this super abundant lantana is influencing the seed dispersal, uh, seed dispersal on the native fruiting tree. After selecting these uh, candidate tree species in heavily invaded lantana area and less invaded lantana area, what I ended up doing is actually a very simple task of counting fruits on the uh, native fruiting tree and the lantana and uh, just sitting in the lantana bushes looking up at the native fruiting tree and the lantana and seeing how many birds are coming, what exactly they are doing when they are coming to uh, lantana and the native fruiting plant. Are they feeding? Are they dropping seed? What type of species are coming? How much time they are spending, etc to answer this big puzzle of seed dispersal uh, interruption because of lantana, if there was any. Um, there were also some very uh, interesting, <laughs> and now when I look back, they, uh, those incidents appear interesting. In, what's, in one such incident where I was uh, looking at the lantana bushes and the native fruiting plant, and my field assistant heard some sound that was actually very usual uh, in Western Ghat. Um, so what happened? Uh, there was this elephant group that was uh, approaching uh, to the place where we were sitting and watching the, uh, the, the birds. Uh, so what we did, we, we just <laughs> walked away uh, to this particular watchtower and stayed there as it was raining. I think the elephant were also taking um, a shade in the trees and we were taking shade in this watchtower. Somehow the elephant sensed our presence and they started shaking the watchtower. <laughs> so that was, uh, I think, just one story that I thought that uh, would be interesting for people who are interested in doing bird research. Uh, Sometimes you happen to encounter species such as elephants uh, in field. So coming back to the question of whether uh, lantana, uh, this non-native invasive species was stealing the dispersers away from the native fruiting plant or not, the answer um, was actually slightly more complicated than I wanted it to be. <laughs> I wanted it to be either competitor or facilitator, but what was happening was slightly more complicated. So. Uh, please don't get uh, um, upset or uh, discouraged by this graph. Uh, I'll just walk you through very quickly um, and gradually. I think you will be able to understand what is happening here. Uh, the open circle that you see is, uh, or the circle that you see are actually the, uh, the fruits removed from the native fruiting plant. Uh, the closed circle represent uh, the native fruiting tree in the heavily invaded area, the open circle represent the less invaded area, whereas the triangle represent the lantana. So what was happening that the open circle um, indicate the number of fruit removed per week 
from the less invaded areas. So you can see that there is a crash in this uh, filled circle, which means that the fruits were actually removed very quickly from uh, the, the native fruiting plant in the heavily invaded area, whereas they were actually very slowly removed. So you can see this is 100% and they are removed close to, let's say, 60% by the end of my uh, study period, whereas um, here in the closed circle from 100% um, by, let's say, fifth week, only 30% of the fruits were left on the native fruiting plant. Okay, so you might think that I am actually supporting the facilitation, which is more frugivorous birds are coming to these uh, native fruiting plant and are removing more fruit. Um, but there are two twists in the tail, and I'll take you to those two twists. One twist was, um, uh, actually both the twists belong to what type of birds are coming and how much, um, how much, how many fruits they are consuming. So this particular graph indicates or shows that there were um, different type of bird that were coming. So for instance, the most frequent bird on the heavily, the dark bars, dark bark, uh, dark bars represent a uh, native fruiting plant in heavily invaded or heavy lantana invasion areas. So you can see that there is more um, frequent visitor, this particular bird species, red vented bulbul. I'm pretty sure you must have seen, you must uh, all have seen this particular bird species. Um, and these were the birds, the large bodied bird, the yellow footed green pigeon and Asian peri blue bird, which were actually very infrequent, okay? So that's one twist in the tail. So what is the next twist? Next twist was this. When these birds were coming, so you can see that although red-vented bulbul was coming very frequently, but as far as the number of fruits that they are eating were actually very less. And that is dependent. I mean, I think it's very obvious. They are very small in size. So every uh, during every visit, they can consume very few birds, uh, very few fruits. Uh, whereas uh, these yellow-footed green pigeon, Asian fairy bluebird, when they were coming, they were actually consuming a lot of fruits. And uh, another interesting piece of information is that you can see that this yellow-footed green pigeon was, there is no dark bar, uh, dark bar here in the yellow-footed green pigeon. That means they were actually coming only to those uh, patches which does not have lantana. Okay, so these are the two twists. That means that these uh, birds, um, the large bodied bird, they were coming infrequently, but were spending more time eating more fruit. Now you can ask me, what does that mean? That means that the, uh, these large bodied fruitivores can actually take more number of fruits away from the parent plant compared to red vented bulbul, which would actually be dis uh, depositing these fruits or these seeds very close to the parent plant. Um, as, a, uh, as a fruiting tree, you want your seed to go far, as far as possible from you to increase uh, your distribution range and your chances of being successful. Um, so from the plant point of view, the strategy um, of getting visited by small bodied fruitivore is not that efficient. So now, uh, if we just join these two pieces of puzzle together, what was happening on the native fruiting trees is that these specialist frugivore were visiting very uh, infrequently, but when they were coming, and they were coming only in less invaded areas, they were spending more time taking more fruits away. Whereas the small-bodied frugivore, uh, frugivore were uh, coming very frequently, but eating few uh, fewer fruits. The other important piece of information is that majority of fruits that were removed from the um, the native fruiting tree uh, in the heavily invaded areas were actually unripe. So I'm going to pause here because I think I've said too many things. The fruits were unripe on the native fruiting plant in the heavily invaded area, but because the lantana was profusely fruiting, the birds came there and they started feeding. And then it, uh, they realized that there is another tree which has fruit, they fed on it, although the fruits were unripe. Majority of the time, it was actually the small bodied frugivores such as red vented bulbul, which actually dispersed, or I would say, consume a lot of unripe fruit. 
On the other hand, the non uh, the uh, native fruiting tree in the less invaded area was visited by these type of large body birds, uh, which came very infrequently, but stayed for long and took uh, many more fruits away from the parent plant. So the answer I know is complicated, but uh, there was actually a negative uh, impact of the, nat the non-native uh, invasive lantana camara on the native seed dispersal, at least I can say for this particular plant species that I studied in uh, Western Ghat. Now from um, my hunger to even understand like what is, how these invasive species are affecting the native seed dispersal did not satiate with this particular question. And during my uh, PhD, I um, also tried to answer this question uh, in a very different ecosystem um, or different system, I would say. So I'm now taking you all the way from Western Ghat to uh, the wet forest or the rainforest of Hawaii. So I'll just play this small video just to show the spectacular, unique um, forest. I don't know if you can see these uh, waterfalls. This particular location is known as Mohihi. So I, I was really, oh. I was really fortunate to work in this uh, very unique ecosystem. Now, uh, from a researcher point of view, it was also something new for me for the first time to hike with only uh, things that I require for the hike. I was not really carrying anything other than uh, my, uh, my bag and maybe the raincoat that I needed. Uh, majority of the stuff was actually hiked in because it was a very steep hike. So we hiked for, let's say, eight and nine hours, and then we reached there. Uh, this was the site that I ended up. So I think this was also <laughs> a very unique experience for me. I, um, I mean, majority of our uh, uh, gears and food groceries used to come or used to helicoptered in when we were in this particular site in Hawaii. Um, now, coming back to the spatial location of where Hawaii is located, you can see that Hawaii is a uh, Hawaiian island or chain of Hawaiian island is this. Um, the nearest continent to Hawaii is 2400 2, miles, and that is California. Um, so the species that came here, the ancestor of the flora and fauna that we see today, have actually crossed this wide barrier of ocean to reach here. And one, I mean, over the period of time, um, again, uh, these species that have came here, they were free from their predator. They, were, they had very few competitor to begin with. And that has led to some very nice adaptive radiation. One such group is actually bird um, of Hawaiian Island. Um, I, I'll try to show you at least a few photographs that I could take of these birds. Um, one such group, which is very peculiar to Hawaiian Island or Hawaiian um, ecosystem, are these honey creeper that feed on nectar and insects. Uh, here in this particular photograph, I hope you can see my pointer is Amakihi, which is actually feeding on the nectar of this particular uh, native fruiting, uh, native flower. And this is Apapane, sorry, this is Ane Aneao. This is this particular bird, which actually looks like a flower is uh, Apapane. And here you have EEV. And all these birds, you can see that they have one um, character that they all share is this decurve bill. Um, but I was not really looking at these honey creeper. What I was interested to study um, was another frugivorous bird, which happened to be the only frugivore in this particular island of Hawaii. Um, this is 
the island Kauai in the Hawaiian uh, island chain, one of the farthest um, island in the island chain. Now, before I go uh, to that particular bird, I wanted to tell you that, um, like, apart from being a very spectacular and unique um, ecosystem, Hawaii also carries this tag of known as, uh, carries the tag of being the extinction capital of the world. And it is because of um, close to, I think, more than 50 extinctions that have happened in, um, in 50 or 60 years in Hawaiian uh, islands, um, which is actually more than the 49, all the 49 states of uh, US. A, a lot more extinction have happened on Hawaii and there have been multiple reasons. Recently, it's the invasive species of multiple types. There are rats, there are cats, there are mongoose, uh, there is avian malaria, mosquitoes, uh, which are actually leading to the loss of these uh, in not these native species, these unique endemic uh, species. And what, one such species is the species that I focused on is uh, Puai Ohi. Uh, it's a thrush species, similar to size in, let's say, I would say slightly smaller than common mina, but it is the only frugivore present on Kauai Island. And there are so many fruiting uh, shrubs and trees that are present on the island. And um, the population size of this particular bird species is actually declining. One of the major concern, one of the major reason for decline is actually rat predation uh, of the eggs and of the females that are sitting on the nest. Um, um, I mean, they are brooding the eggs and they come, the rats come and feed or predate on the female. But thankfully, there have been reintroduction, uh, captive breeding and reintroduction effort. Um, at least in one side, it has been successful uh, due to also uh, management or control of rat and other non-native uh, uh, predator on, on this particular site in Hawaii. So what I wanted to study is, uh, apart from this particular frugivorous bird, what has happened simultaneously or over a period of time is there have been introduction of non-native birds. There are, um, to your surprise, when I went there, I saw red vented bulbul, rose ring parakeet, red whiskered bulbul, and I was not at all happy to see all those birds that do not belong to Hawaiian uh, islands reaching there because of uh, human activities. So uh, one species which has actually invaded the native forest and is now uh, dispersing or is actually establishing a good population is Japanese white eye. I hope I have the photo of, yes. So this is what is happening. The population of Puai Ohi, the native uh, bird is declining, but the small size native non-native dispersers are increasing as well as the uh, predation, seed predation, and also the predation on the native uh, bird, Puai Ohi, is increasing because of rat. So you can see that this native seed dispersal is threatened because of uh, the threatened uh, status of the frugivore as well as the predation by these non-native um, uh, species. And there are actually three uh, species of rat on the island. Now, again, what I did, I selected site that um, have Ohi, the native frugivore, and side that have um, actually one or maybe no Puai Ohi. So it was a control and a treatment kind of a design. I selected sites or sampling site um, across uh, these, uh, I hope you can see these uh, river, uh, sorry, streams. So this particular bird species actually uh, breeds or nests in the, in the cliff falls. So these are like uh, walls near uh, the small streams and these are more or less upright and they chose these areas so that they can um, avoid the predators such as rats. Um, so I selected these sites in um, close to the stream and in the upland area slightly away from uh, the streams. What was different in these two sites, the Kuai Kuai or the site that is closer uh, to us, um, I think to, to our hike, uh, was the one where we have few or 
no poi ohi but mo he the, the the video that i played was the site where we still have poi ohi and i think in good uh, good numbers um but what was uh, similar is the abundance or the density of the uh, non native birds so white rump shama chinese uh, uh, laughing thrush and the japanese white eye what i found uh, was again i think not something that we were not really expecting um where we have he we found that majority of the fruits uh, so we what we did we actually installed the traps these are uh, these were nothing but the uh, pots that had a mesh over it what it did it allowed the fruits and the seeds to fall in the in the traps so i collected these um, whatever was there in the trap um, uh, i think uh, twice in a month and i looked for the seeds that did not have or the uh, the seed that did not have the the the, uh, the flesh uh, around it so it was very evident that the area that do not have the native fruity were received very few fruits very few seeds in the seed trap it was very um, uh, i mean to us we were very devastated to see that the non native uh, birds were actually dispersing very few uh, seeds apart from that um, we also looked at the fecal sample of the poi oh he the native fruiting uh, fruit eating bird and japanese white eye which is somewhat similar to the indian white eye that you see around your houses so what was interesting again uh, to cut the jargon uh, the, the pink blobs represent the japanese white eye and the green blobs represent the native fruiting bird which is slightly larger in size than the Uh, the white eye what you have on the x axis is the seed size and this is the frequency of occurrence so what we were looking for that how many times when we are looking into the fecal sample we find what type of seed what is their seed size so because we expected that poi ohi which is a native fruiting fruit eating bird would be actually feeding largely on the large uh, fruits Uh, and that is exactly what we found out that japanese white eye the pink pink blob uh, is actually very high or very i um, mean you see this large blob that indicates that they were frequently feeding on the small sized uh, uh, fruits the japanese white eye whereas the poi ohi was actually feeding on uh, the large sized uh, fruits i also want to point out that we had very few fecal sample for both the species we were actually um, we used misnet to collect the fecal sample of the non native bird but the native bird the permission to uh, uh, capture this bird the poi ohi uh, was not granted because it's a species of concern so what through these two story of lantana in our own backyard in western ghat and uh, the um the non native species or the invasive species invasive bird um in hawaii is telling us that these invasive species are actually disrupting these ecological interactions that have evolved over thousands of years um they can actually these species have the potential to change the the plant ecosystem or the plant communities as well as uh, the bird communities that you see uh, imagine uh, that when the fruit that are available in a particular area change what changes with it the the species that feed on it apart from that um, we were especially for uh, hawaii we were very concerned about uh, the rat predation or the uh, the predation of the fruits by the rats because they were mostly chewing uh, the large fruits but to our surprise we also found out so i was also looking at the gut content of the rat and i found out that they were um at least the small sized fruits were intact in their crop which means they might be also helping in or helping in dispersal of the small sized fruit so now in hawaiian island what is happening that you have two dispersers the japanese white eye and the rats which are actually helping in dispersal of the small sized fruit so over a period of time what we would see a shift in plant community from large uh, sized fruit to small sized community okay 
so but apart uh, now i am taking you to the next story i hope you guys are not bored please stop me <laughs> if you guys are uh, uh, i mean if you think that i'm going too fast or if you think that you need a break okay so what i will be talking about now is the work that i have done uh, during my phd um, which is again very close to my heart and this is in the himalayan foothills um i think yes so but when i started working in this um, in this region i was actually doing my phd in wildlife institute of india and majority of people that you encounter in wildlife institute wii are the uh, people who are working on tiger <laughs> so it's very uh, i mean sometimes the forest guard used to tease me that are ma'am you were, you are only working on bird they never considered the work that i was doing on bird to be of any significance but what i was studying uh, was this um, disturbance um, by the uh, or i would say a pressure on the uh, himalayan foothill forest because of the dependence of the local communities um but before i go any further i hope you all know that this particular landscape is very unique because it hosts or it harbors um, um a good population of um this large carnivore that we have tiger and also very good populations of um of uh, elephant but other than that uh, i work on bird and this particular landscape is known for its rich avifaunal diversity um one of the largest woodpecker also happens to be found here in this particular area you have great hornbill but it is also uh, is there a question um but it is also a landscape which is uh, one of the heavily populated areas um, in the world uh, and it is no surprise this is very fertile area um one of the communities that have occupied this area for a very long time is a semi nomadic pastoral community called gujar um but i would like to also highlight that apart from gujar there are other communities uh, the especially the villagers uh, which are actually living almost on the edge of uh, this particular area so what you are seeing here this particular region is uh, a part of shivalik uh, landscape between river yamuna and ganga and this solid black line represent a uh, part which falls in rajaji national park so i was largely working in rajaji national park dehradun forest division shivalik forest division so um coming back to the pressures uh, what local communities gujjars do is that they uh, extract biomass in form of firewood fodder from this particular um, region and they have been doing this for a very long time uh earlier the gujjars used to go to the higher altitude uh during uh, uh winter season oh, no summer season i'm sorry i'm forgetting the season right now um but they, there was this um, uh, some movement across season therefore the region uh, was getting some respite from pressure uh, at least once in a year but what happened over the year is the population of gujjars increased both in the higher altitude and the lower altitude region uh, basically the valleys and the uh, the one that were in the himachal and jammu kashmir region um, so there was some restrict kya tha ha isko isko ha isko select speaker bhi ye kar do ha ab hona chahiye sorry mute karo okay sorry monica no problem <laughs> no issue yeah so i was just uh, uh, sharing that um the i mean this particular area was experiencing biomass extraction now you might think that um so what i mean biomass is getting extracted and oh, i mean once there is rain it will uh, the leaves would come back but uh, what was happening i hope uh, i have the slide for it yes so these were the uh, activities that were um, that were prevalent in this particular area so um, what is happening here is that the small gujjar uh, girl is lopping uh, terminalia tomentosa tree for uh, the cattle or the livestock that they have here uh, the gujjar uh, one gujjar is actually taking uh, its Uh, livestock for grazing inside the forest apart from that the, as i told you that 
the uh, the villagers were also dependent on forest for collecting firewood with, for their own consumption and also for selling to uh, the nearby um, and habas and hotels um apart from that people were also uh, collecting small timber i don't want to talk about that but yeah um these were the pressures that were operating in this uh, region now compared to uh, let's say logging and fire which you can um, actually quantify using remote sensing and gis uh, satellite uh, images this is a pressure which we, which is really difficult to quantify and also therefore difficult to manage so what i wanted to understand is how this particular pressure is affecting the plant and the bird community here i'll just speak very uh, uh, i mean briefly about what was happening to the bird community so what happened when we alter the forest structure what happens when let's say we are cutting few twigs for for firewood or for collecting the leaves from the trees what i uh, selected was the three forest type in this particular region i think i can talk about it when if you have any question uh, but i'll talk very briefly what happens when uh, you collect the leaves so what uh, happens is that more sunlight can actually now can reach to the ground uh, and that result in um, the soil moisture getting evaporated so that creates the condition for species which are sun loving for instance lantana camara is one such species which actually goes re grows really well if the canopy is broken more sunlight is reaching to the ground and that was exactly what was happening um yeah so what i found out coming to the findings what i found out that um the bird species richness actually increased that means the number of species that i was finding across disturbed and undisturbed areas so in disturbed areas there were more species other than that there were also uh, as far as the density or the number of individual of a species are concerned there were more individuals in um, in these disturbed area which also happened to have more lantana now from the previous talk if you remember i was telling you that uh, lantana uh, provides this particular resource of fruit and also nectar to the uh, to the bird species um again <laughs> there are twist in this particular story also what i found out that the majority of the species that increased or that was resulting in increased richness and density were the species uh, that are generalists so for instance the increased number of common tailor bird ashiprinia uh, jungle babbler bulbul so these were the species that were increasing and not really the species such as indian grey hornbill orient pied hornbill okay now other than that i also was interested in looking at different foraging guild and how these disturbances were influencing um, the different uh, feeding groups what i found out that the species that uh, look for insects in the canopy were actually negatively affected by the fodderwood and fire uh, firewood collection for instance uh, your minivets your warblers these were the species that declined or uh, uh, declined in number because of the uh, firewood and fodder collection um lantana and fire both actually helped in increasing uh, the richness of this particular uh, guild or uh, group i would say sailing insectivore the species that catches insect in the air so for instance drongos and uh, fly catcher were those species that increased um yes increase or improvement in the vegetation structure was also uh, responsible for increase in these two groups uh, other than that the understory insectivore the species that forages in the understory or the shrubs were in were decreasing because of the timber extraction but were actually uh, uh, getting facilitated because of lantana um, uh, because of the lantana increase so the results that i found in this study were also very mixed but one thing was again clear that lantana was making the sites that were other otherwise dissimilar the dry forest and um, dry uh, anogesis latifolia forest and dry shivalik sal forest very similar in their community composition 
So otherwise, let's say if you pick uh, an energy source like Tifolia forest, it will have a certain bird community. But uh, when it is disturbed uh, and has lantern eye in it, you will see that the bird communities are becoming more and more similar. Okay, and that is generally at the cost of the specialist species. Okay, um, one uh, thing that I am really, uh, I think, um, I don't know whether I can say proud, but I am really happy that I also identify certain bird species that the forest department can use for monitoring, uh, monitoring the disturbance that is operating in this particular area. So I found out that species such as Cinerea stit, which actually forages on the small twigs of, uh, of trees, was actually declining uh, because of, uh, I think this is uh, firewood collection. So we found out indicator species for different disturbances in this particular area. Now, again, uh, coming back to, because I promised in the very beginning that I'll tell you, uh, I, I'll share uh, these findings and uh, how I have collected this information. So this was only through um, these point transect, which requires me uh, to have a pair of binocular and a rangefinder, nothing else, and a GPS maybe. Uh, so using this, uh, or I would say repeated count in these uh, disturbed and undisturbed area actually helped me to find out what this particular cryptic disturbance uh, of biomass collection was um, causing in this particular uh, landscape. Uh, Preeti, I think we are running out of time, so I would probably uh, stop here. Um, I had a few more slides to talk about urban um, or the urban ecology work that I'm doing, but I think uh, that would be too much. So I'll just stop here pretty. Okay, um, sure, Monica. We can maybe, I mean, if you want a minute or two to wrap up, that's fine. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I think, um, other than, I mean, I was thinking about this and I was thinking that there might be you know, some of you who, who will think that or who are probably not doing research, research, and I still want to, uh, still want to contribute to the research that is happening in, uh, in our country. And I would strongly recommend using uh, uh, or actually observing birds around uh, your houses, or if you're going to certain areas, observe bird there, report uh, bird from those location using eBird app. I don't know if you guys have um, downloaded the app on your phones or not, but please do that. And if you have questions, please reach out to me. Preeti, that, that is about it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Monica. Um, thanks for the wonderful talk and taking the time to speak with us. Um, we have some time for questions since Monica has wrapped up um, her talk. So if you, any of you have any questions, please use the chat box. Um, if you would like to unmute and ask questions, please raise your hand so um, I can help. Uh, we have one question uh, right now that has just come in. Nishant is asking, uh, what was the duration of your study in the Shivalik region? Hmm. So that work, uh, as far as the field work was concerned, I spent three years. Uh, one year was simply for uh, getting accustomed of the bird community because uh, that was the first time I was actually working on the entire bird community. So uh, apart from uh, looking at the bird through binocular, it takes a lot of time. Um, when you're doing point transit, you have to be really good with their calls also. So I was just training myself to, um, or familiarizing myself with their calls and how to look for bird in, in a sal forest. Right, thanks, Monica. Um, Patrick David is asking uh, whether, he seems to have seen uh, plenty of fruiting trees in some areas, but no fruit eating birds. And do you think there's any reason that that might happen? I think I would need more information, Pat Patrick, <laughs> um, where you have seen those trees and what was the season, etc. Um, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to add more to that, Patrick, I think that would be nice. Yeah, Patrick, if you have um, more information on where you may have seen this, please type it out, or if you would like to unmute, let me know. 
Um, Sagnik Nandi is asking us, um, asking you to explain the last slide with the which had firewood collection plots on them. Oh, actually, that slide is up right now. Huh. So, uh, okay, so what we have here is uh, the density of these bird species and on um, on the x axis is the amount of or I would say the percentage of firewood collection. So uh, with increasing, let's say if I have to explain this graph of scenario state, what is happening that the density uh, of this particular species scenario state is highest at the low uh, level of firewood collection, but as the firewood collection increases, the density decreases. And same was happening with the nut hatches. So species that forages on the small twigs uh, were negatively affected or their densities were de uh, declining because of the firewood collection. Thanks, Monica. I hope suddenly that clears your doubt. Um, we have another question from Hari. Uh, Hari says, very nice talk. Uh, he's curious to know about how you counted the number of fruits. <laughs> On trees. So we marked few branches, Hari. Uh, thank you for the question. We marked few branches on um, on both the species that we have selected. Generally, that is how it is done. So one thing is crop size estimation, where you try to estimate the entire uh, fruit on a particular species. But if you if your objective is to also track, um, let's say as I have shown, uh, track the fruit consumption over weeks, then you tag few branches and uh, repeat the count on those branches at a um, certain interval. I hope that answers your question, Hari. Yeah, I think it was, he was curious about the method used to estimate fruit, fruit crop size. Thanks, that was clear. We have several questions coming in. I may not be able to take all of them, uh, everyone, but I'll try and um, pick a few. Um, how does one familiarize with birds in a particular forest area, especially for beginners? Uh, mm -hmm that's in the chat box that I think several students may benefit from. So if you could answer that. So I think uh, there is no shortcut to familiarize yourself with the bird community. And if you're working in Western Ghat, I think that uh, job is more daunting. <laughs> uh, to, uh, what I did was actually just go out in the morning um, and listen to the birds, watch bird. One thing I think most of us do is uh, put pressure on ourselves that why am I not identifying bird species compared to let's say someone else. Don't do that. Uh, always try to write uh, certain features of the bird species that you have seen. I would say that if you have seen let's say 10 species in, a, in, in one single morning and have tried to write down their characters, Try to familiarize yourself with the calls and um, made some uh, notes also about the call. Don't think too much that, oh, I should uh, try to describe the call very uh, nicely. I think that is okay. As long as you identify the call, that is more than enough. Then you can utilize these. Thankfully, now there are these apps that are um, that are available to us, you know, Canto, eBird, where you can actually cross-check for the call that you have uh, heard and I think once you make that connect with the particular call or a bird, um, the way it sits or the way it forages, I think that uh, is something that no book can teach you. Books are there to help you, and thankfully the bird count account uh, bird count accounts are now also there that can help you to uh, clarify between confusing species. Um, so again. I think going for bird walks uh, with few people alone is something that I would recommend. Thanks, Monica. Um, Misha has an interesting question. She is asking uh, about the amount of effort or data that it takes to confidently establish cause-effect relationships. I'm guessing she means with respect to disturbances that you talked about. Um, oh yeah, she says between disturbance and decline in bird communities. Um, Nisha, again, I mean, I think it is dependent on, so for instance, my uh, study area was uh, large and I was looking at three different forest types. Um, but I would say, uh, I, I, I don't know how to answer this question, Nisha. <laughs> It is, it is something that requires a bit of statistics also. So you need to uh, have a certain information of the sample size, the smallest 
a sample size that you can have uh, to uh, establish these relationships. But if I have to just say, let's say for a given habitat, if you're asking me, I would say that let's say 30, 40 plot should be uh, good enough point, point transit visited uh, at least three to four times. Yeah, that is a tough one uh, to come to. I'm sorry, there's a lot of disturbance in my background. Apologies for that. No problem. You can hear me. Um, Ragan is asking whether you've seen any changes in distribution and abundance of migratory birds that used to visit your field site. Um, if your study was long ago, have there been any declines that you have seen? As far as the terrestrial birds uh, were concerned, I don't know who have asked this question, uh, Preeti, but uh, what I uh, actually looked at was the relationship uh, of migratory bird species and the disturbance. So in a way, I wanted to see whether they are behaving differently to disturbance compared to the resident bird species, because these are the species that are coming and becoming part of the community in a given period of time and going back. So I, I expected them to be actually um, utilizing or uh, I would say the resident species being more uh, have the competitive edge and are uh, forcing them to um, uh, what should I say uh, to the suboptimal habitats but that was not what was happening I found out that there was a strong correlation between um, between the resident and the migratory bird species. And there is something known as heterospecific attraction. Um, at least that is how I uh, could understand uh, what might be operating in this particular area. So the resident, uh, the migratory bird species were actually using the resident bird as a cue for foraging in a particular region. So there was uh, actually positive relationship between the resident and the migratory bird species. Now, I think uh, uh, I need to go back in that particular area, lay more plots and find out if the uh, abundances or the if there are certain changes in the migratory bird species. There have been changes in the landscape itself. Uh, uh, Gujars have been uh, relocated out, but at the same time, there are more disturbances in the matrix, matrix around uh, this particular area. So it's a very interesting question to look into. Thanks. Um, thanks, Monica. Uh, Chaitanya is asking about uh, indicator species that you spoke about. Um, he says that ascertaining an indicator species uh, is quite commendable. Um, his question is, how were you able to determine the indicator birds? Was it only through counting or was it also accounting for some behavioral traits of the birds? Hmm. Okay, so I um, there is something known as indicator species analysis that actually um, take into account, uh, I think uh, uh, there are a few things that it looks into. The abundance is definitely one and how, uh, how specific they are, uh, the species are to a particular region. So for instance, if there are 10 patches where I have counted the bird and in uh, three of those plots, I always encounter the species and also in higher number, that means those particular bird species are indicating that particular habitat. So I actually uh, only used um, uh, the information on the frequency and the abundance, but not their uh, behavioral trait. Chaitanya, thank you so much for the question. Thanks, Monica. Uh, we are sort of running out of time, but I'll take one more last question and others, uh, apologies for not being able to take questions. Uh, you can reach out to Monica. I'm sure she'd be happy to help. Yes. Um, uh, Krishna is asking, how do forest fires, natural or induced in the region, affect undergrowth in vegetation and the bird communities along with it? Hmm, that's a very good question. And I would um, also um, acknowledge that um, unlike other disturbances that I was uh, trying to quantify, fire was very cryptic, um, especially because um, there are differences in fires um, in terms of intensity, frequency, certain area might be more prone to fires and the bird community over the year would evolve, I mean, would, um, I think, um, would be shaped by how frequently a particular area get fire. Uh, so what I was looking into or what I um, was using was only the present absence of fire sign that I could see and those could be the recent or the old signs. So I, um, with that being said, um, fire at least uh, in Shivalik region 
because now um, the fires are becoming more and more frequent in that particular uh, region um may, could be because of the 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 overall increase in the uh, the temperature and also because of the increasing antenna cover but there are other social reasons as well i don't want to um, talk about that and distract but um, as far as the bird community is concerned one uh, clear um, impact is the loss of habitat the other thing is even if you if, if a bird is there in an area which was recently burned one thing is that the temperature increases and that has a negative consequence on the insect abundance in that particular region so um, food availability is something that declines and that has a consequence for the bird community in that particular region i hope that answer your question um so rust thanks monica uh, thanks so much for making the time i i had one last question now that i'm hosting thank you priti <laughs> i had to ask questions as well um, <laughs> studied in ways of species in uh, an island system and in uh, not so much of an island system in a continent mm -hmm. system as well uh, can you uh, for the benefit of everyone here tell us a little bit of reflection uh, that you've had about invasives on islands versus invasives on mainlands so to say it was actually very depressing um, the invasive species in the island ecosystem because unlike um, the continents where there are uh, actually a very small proportion of non native species that can establish and become invasive the island um because there are no uh, predators there are no competitor um there were quite a lot of invasive species um that were present on the island and unfortunately it's very difficult also to manage those invasive species i told you about rat but there were other species that have been introduced to manage the invasive species and those species has now become invasive um there have been so many um, introduction of plant species which actually belong to let's say himalayan ecosystem and to other continent um and it's a very difficult task unless and until one have the resources and i'm talking about fund and i'm talking about logistic um it looks like that maybe hawaii it belongs to um, the the developed world they may have resources and people might be going and trying to do everything to control non native invasive species but that is not the case hawaii received very few um funds for um endangered species conservation and for uh, managing invasive species and again i think the charismatic species are the one that usually get funding for Uh, uh for either control or for management but uh, it's very complicated on the island ecosystem i think i'm really uh, concerned about um, island getting invaded by uh, these invasive species thanks thank you monica um i think we should close the session now we are already past a little past our time uh, but i'll take a moment to thank monica so much for making the time to speak to us today and thank you all for joining us uh, for this session uh, we will be conducting more such sessions in the future uh, where we will invite ornithologists and researchers to uh, talk about their own work uh, so those among you who are interested please do um, follow these um, these advertisements we usually put up information on our website uh, again it's ornithology.in um do follow us on the website um thank you very much for joining and uh, until next time thank you preeti for giving me this opportunity and i really love to hear from all of them uh, what they have uh, what their point of views are about the work that i've been doing so please uh, feel free to reach out to me thank you so much thank you bye bye bye